So today we're talking about measures of central tendency. And a measure of central tendency is a single score that best describes the central location of a distribution of scores. So what I want to focus on is that this is a one answer. This is a single score that tries to come up with the best score for all the responses that we have. That's a pretty tough task to do. You have lots of answers. You want one score that best represents everybody. So we're going to talk about three different types of measures of central tendency. And the first one we'll talk about is the mode. So the mode, it's pretty easy. It is the most frequent score. So that means if you have a collection of scores, you just pick out the one that happens the most. So I'm going to tell a couple stories um, to see if we can exemplify that. So the first one you can think about, if you've ever gone to the store and they have a, a shoe, like a flip-flop or a hat or a sweater, and they say one size fits all. And do you think it really is one size fits all? Or you might want to think what it should be phrased as. It's probably most likely should be phrased as one size fits most. And what they're doing there is they're not sure if this product is going to sell. And so rather than make eight different sizes of this flip-flop, um, they're going to make the flip-flop in the size that's most commonly purchased and then see if it sells. If it sells, then they'll make the other sizes. But there's a lot of cost and effort that goes into making all those sizes. So first they're just going to pick the most commonly uh, selected shoe size, fit those people, see if those people buy it, and if it does, then they'll invest on in a larger range. So what they use is the mode. They find what is the most common shoe size and then design their flip-flop or their hat or their sweater around that size. So that's an example of um, using the mode. Now this one really is kind of like a storytelling time, but it's one of my favorite stories. And it's a true story. I just can't remember who the people were, so I apologize for not being able to tell you accurate names. But this was back in castle era, and there was a guy who wanted to storm a castle, um, and he brought his troops all the way from a long distant land, and they were right coming up, up on the castle to storm it. And so they were hidden out in the um, outskirts so that the people in the castle couldn't see them, so they could have the element of surprise. And they had to decide how long to make their ladders so that they could storm the wall of the castle. Now, you typically don't bring ladders with you because that's pretty labor-intensive to bring with you. And you then have to decide how long to make them. Now, if you've ever watched good movies, you know what happens if you make the ladder too long. So if you've ever seen a movie where the ladder's too long, what do you think can happen when you run up, put the ladder on the castle wall, and then you start to climb that wall? What do you think the defense of the castle is going to do? So if you haven't seen it in the movies, they push the ladder over and say, well, you know, good luck, see you tomorrow. That would ruin the element of surprise, right? So then um, they have to make sure that the ladder isn't too short. If the ladder is too short, then you go, you start to climb up the wall, and you can't get there, and they're like, oh, wait, sorry, we'll have to fix my ladder, see you tomorrow. So both things would ruin the element of surprise if it's too long or too short. So you want the ladder to be just right, so it fits right on the wall where you can kind of leap over once you get the top, but they can't reach over and, and push it away. So that means that when this uh, gentleman was trying to storm the castle, he had to pick the best length of ladders to make. Um, so he had all his men, and let's say there's probably women there too, line up along the, the edge of the mountain that they're hiding behind and look at the castle they want to storm. And back in that time, the bricks that made the castle were kind of a standard size. So he had everybody count how many bricks there were to the top. So then after everybody was done counting, he said, hey, everybody tell me their score. And so he runs down the line, and 55, 55, 55, 54, 55, 56, 55, 95. What? 95. Okay, anyway, 55, 55, 54. And so what you found is that while well, there was some variability, some people saw 55, some people saw 54, somebody has double vision and saw 90-something, for the most part, people counted 55 bricks. And so he used the mode to decide that's the length of the ladder. And sure enough, it won, saved the day, stormed the castle, it won at everything. So notice that if you have an understanding already of what a mean is, a mean wouldn't have worked because that person who saw 90-something bricks would have made the ladder need to be taller than it actually needed to be. And so the mode was a really good example here of using the data that you have instead of saying, let's average them all out, instead saying, hey, let's just choose what most commonly was selected and use that moving forward. And so a last example I have is if you're thinking about collecting information about um, degrees, then, um, you know, you could say, uh, you could look at 
psychology degrees, biology degrees, these are data that don't work to find a mean for, right? Because these are words. You can't do psychology plus biology divided by two. And so when you have data like this, it's really nice to have the mode where you could say the most common degree was psychology, right? So the mode there works as a really nice measure of central tendency um, that maybe other measures of central tendency wouldn't work for that type of data. Now let's talk about the pros and the cons of mode. Pros. So first, it works for nominal data. So remember, nominal data are words. They don't have order, they're just words. So it might be something like your religion or your ethnicity or your major. So as I just pointed out, you can have a mode for nominal data, um, which is perfect because otherwise we may not be able to summarize our data, our nominal data, with some kind of measure of central tendency. It's good when you have two kind of patterns. Let's say that psychology and biology were equally likely to have happened. So it's hard to have two means. I sure can't have two means. But when we have a mode, I could say, hey, there are two modes. Psychology and biology were both equally likely to be the most commonly selected major. It's darn easy to compute. All you have to do is hit a, or hit plus on your, uh, no, actually, you just have to, <laughs> excuse, sorry, I got distracted and I thought, well, where am I going? Um, it's the easiest to compute because all you have to do is know how to count. You just have to look up what is the most common response, and that's your mode. And then another pro of a mode, which may not make sense right now, but when we talk about the pros and the cons of the other measures of central tendency, it might become more clear. But the score we got actually comes from the data set. So if I were, say, um, looking at most common shoe size, if I'm counting how many people have a shoe size of, let's say, seven and a half, I might find seven and a half is the most common woman's shoe size. But if I had done a mean, I might have actually found that the most common shoe size for women was a 7.25 even though there is no such thing as a 7.25, um, that's how it would have calculated out if I had to find the mean of a shoe size. So in, you can see for the mean, we might actually get a score that doesn't really exist, but that's just how it calculates. Whereas for the mode, you're guaranteed to get data that come right from the data set. I'm going to get a shoe size that actually exists because it's the most common shoe size. All right, the downsides of mode. It ends up ignoring all the rest of that information. So if we think about uh, the counting of the bricks, there was somebody there who saw 90-something bricks, and we just completely ignored them. Now, that might be that, okay, so they have double vision, or there's something wrong with they didn't understand the task. But there may be a legit thing going on there. Maybe right where they were looking, there were 98 bricks, and we've just completely ignored the fact that they saw that. If I were calculating a shoe size and someone says, I have a size 22 shoe size, they would be ignored if it's the mode. And statisticians, we don't like ignoring data. All data are interesting. And so it's not really a good thing that we ignore all the rest of the data. And then you may end up with samples that have no mode. So let's say I have four people in front of me and I ask them what their shoe size is. And the first person says, I'm a size six. The next person says, oh, I am a seven. And then the next person says, I'm a nine. And the last person says, I'm a 10. So if we have all those different shoe sizes, for my small data set of just four people, I don't have an answer that appeared more than once. So I ended up with no mode. So that's a downside is that the whole goal of this is to come up with a one score that best represents everybody. And then I may end up ending, uh, with no score at all if I'm just using the mode. 